He's always been there for me. You see, Jesus met me when I was at my lowest. And if you don't know Jesus, know this. He is the greatest example of generosity this world of greed has ever seen. And when Jesus hit the scene, he changed the scenery and met diversity with serenity. If you're looking for peace, he offers plenty. Jesus was and Jesus will forever be king. And when the angels sing, they sing of the grace that was displayed for sinners like me. I can't explain him and I can't describe him. And if I could, he wouldn't be Jesus because you can't explain eternity and you can't comprehend the galaxies. But it was the loving hands of Jesus who spun them into existence and created man knowing he would go to the cross to pay our sentence there was a certificate of judgment with a period after the sentence and we were sentenced to death long before he said it is finished he is a father to the orphan a shelter for the homeless a hiding place for the abused and an anchor for our storms he stormed the gates of hell and came out on top and the power of his gospel cannot be stopped even when the world tries and they try a lot. He traded places with Barabbas and became the catalyst of missions across the world covering every portion of the atlas. If you're in need of rest, I know of a mattress. If you don't know Jesus, your future is tragic, but he gladly embraced tragedy so we could live in his presence of majesty. His presence is presence, and it's his presence that presents preciousness to a world of peasants. He is far from pretentious, but still loves those who are. He is the light of the world and hung the stars. He brings the dead to life and delivers life to the dead. He took a crown of thorns on his head so we could put crowns at his feet, and I I can't wait until I get to kiss his feet that were nailed to a cross for me and for you and for every person around the world. He loves the world and I love his word because the word became flesh and in his flesh he demonstrated the word to the world. He is an example to every boy and every girl. He is a lover of black people. He is a lover of white people. He is a lover of the unchurched and the assembly under the steeple. He doesn't see the believers failures but still takes time to celebrate their faithfulness. It's the power of the spirit that enables us and gives us boldness when the world labels us and if you want to label me please call me a Jesus freak if that freaks you out good because it's better to be good with God than to fight being misunderstood by a world that could never understand so let it be understood that I don't worship man we worship Jesus and although he doesn't need us he still sees us and pleads with us to run to the cross where he bled for us his heart bleeds for us his heart grieves for us but still graciously grants us a pardon for our treason in a season where the world tries to explain the way the work of the spirit with human reasoning there's a reason they can't because the spirit is like the wind and the wind cannot be seen but loved is the one who believes without seeing the unseen I'm telling you today that Jesus is something he's something more He's something great, and if you want to know him, you don't have to wait. He stands at the narrow path with a key to the gate, and you only have to reach out and embrace his grace. I don't care who's president. I have a king who is always present. I don't care who holds musical celebrity. The voice of the Lord will always be the sweetest melody. I don't care who owns the riches of the globe. My Jesus holds more wealth than one ruby on his robe. I don't care who is the strongest or the fastest. Nothing matches the creator of the universe and his immortal, infinite status. I don't care about religious leaders who died and stayed dead. I'll only worship the one who conquered death and wears a crown on his head. His name is Jesus, and I'm telling you, he's something. He was faithful yesterday, and he is faithful today. I can feel his presence whenever I pray. And when the time comes for me to fade away, I'll remember the day I heard him say, My name is Jesus. Wow, saw that this week, and this goes ties in right to what we're gonna be talking about this morning. Powerful, powerful words. We come this morning to church, and we get up from watching college football, or whatever, yesterday, and we get here, and we forget the power that we have, we, get the, we forget the fellowship that we have, and that we're coming to serve and worship a risen Savior, that's powerful, powerful stuff. March 22nd, 1992, I was about 14 years old, 13, 14 years old, Tulsa, Oklahoma. My parents took me to a place, they took me for my whole life. It was, David, you're going to the Tulsa workshop. Workshop was the place where about five or 6,000 church leaders, people from around the world would come together and worship and learn strategies, how to be better Christians, how to, how to live better, how to do, how to teach better. And so I'm a kid the whole time in this deal. And I just always just walked around, just kind of like looked up. I was bored out of my mind at times. But at this day, I will never forget what happened March 26, 1992. We were in the Tulsa Pavilion where the Tulsa drillers are at. 
And the pavilion's a big arena. Little, it's smaller than the Bon Bronze Center, but it holds about 6,000 people. And I can remember being up there in the, the, the section, kind of, you know, about 20 rows up, packed one night. Jeff Wallen was preaching, and I can remember an event person running down to him during the middle of this, this, this um, sermon he was having, running down, getting up on the stage, and whispering in his ear, and he says, everybody, a tornado is coming toward us. He says, everybody, calm down. We're at, they're asking us all, if you're at the top, to get down. If you're in the middle, stay back. And if you're, the, and if you're at the top, come and get underneath. So I was at the top, and I remember seeing everybody like, it was, there wasn't much panic. Because I thought, man, this is awesome. We're a bunch of Christians. This is, gonna, you know, this is good. And so I can remember as a kid going, what's going on? I remember mom and dad saying, let's go. We walk down, and people follow us, and we go down, and we're underneath. And I will never forget, as soon as we got down there, 5,000 people just started singing, holy, holy, holy. Just echoing off the concrete of this building. And I can remember going, what in the world? I'm a kid going, this is powerful. One, as this, because these people aren't scared. They're not scared. So it gave me peace as a child. The parents were like, it's going to be all right. The tornado was coming through t- Tulsa. We were singing, and we just started praying and singing. So then it gets closer, and then it check marks in the parking lot and goes away. I will never forget that day, because it was out of the blue, something came, scared us, feared, like, what has happened? This is it. But I saw resilience and calmness in Christians that changed my life forever. Changed my life forever. This is the power of what we're going to talk about this morning. Turn your Bibles to that right there, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 is a powerful chapter in the Bible. Mark is, if you read the book of Mark in the Gospels, it is like watching a movie. It is awesome. But something, somewhere, somehow we have missed maybe one of the greatest things in the Bible because we just fly over it. This week has been so exciting to me, studying this. It's been on my mind for two weeks, but I thought, man, I get to preach this. This is going to be awesome. But look at what happens in Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Before we read 45, I want you to understand what just happened because that is going to make sense in this story. Right before this, right before this time, Jesus walks into these people and there's like 5,000 men, the Bible says, looking about 10 to 15,000 people. The disciples are panicked. The guy goes, I don't, I, I need, we're hungry. Well, we're hungry. A little boy walks up to him and says, here's five loaves and two fish, maybe the greatest miracle in the story, a child sharing everything they had for people. Jesus blesses that, feeds the people. They get done, they eat, and there's food afterwards, and as soon as that's over, they said, all right, let's go. And then 45 comes up, and this is incredible. Watch carefully. It says, then Jesus left the vicinity. Oh, I'm on the wrong spot. Sorry, guys. It says here, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Now stop there. I'm going, why is he so, guys, get in the boat. What's the deal? What's the point on how Jesus is being, telling these disciples, hey, go. There's a word here. In the Bible, that word made, where you see made, it's a Greek word called this. It's called enaxin. And what this means is it's a forceful way of telling the guys, get out of here. That doesn't seem like Jesus to me. But somehow in this word, this sentence, he's telling the guys, Peter, guys, get in the boat. And they're like, hey, we want to stay and do this. No, get in the boat and go. 
This changes the story dynamically, and you'll see this in a second. He's, what, how I see that verse is when this word comes up, it's telling these disciples, Jesus is telling his people, us, I'll take care of it. You guys go. Because you all know how hard it is at times to work with people or to dismiss people from your home as he, this happens. where It wears you out. Jesus says, I'll take it. You guys are doing awesome. Get in the boat and go. He's caring for these guys. It shows that he cared. He, he didn't have to, he, that they didn't have to dismiss the crowds. He would. Let's keep going. So get into the boat and go ahead and, of, the, of him to Bethsaida while he, was, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went on a mountainside to pray. We could talk about the rest, that, the rest of the, the, the hour, but we're not. When evening came, the boat was in the, in, the la- in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. 48. Hunker down on this. Get ready, because I think this is how it all comes together. He saw, Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. He saw the disciples straining. We look at them and go, well, yeah, they're, they're probably there yelling at each other. But I want you to get this in terms of what the Bible's talking about. This is a miracle in itself. And this is something we often forget. That God noticed them struggling. Unlike the Old Testament where you had to be cleansed and you had to be set apart and go in the Holy, in the holy of Holies just to be talked to God Here, he's breaking all that away and says, you're normal people and you're sinners, but I'm going to go to you because I notice you, because I love you and I care for you. Jesus sees them. And there is power, church. There is power in being noticed. There's power in that. And Jesus is showing these guys, us, that you matter. Your straining, your struggle is bad. I notice and I see you. I am not distant from you. There's power in being noticed and Jesus showing it here. Jesus saw the straining of this. You've all seen this movie, right? The Sandlot. One of the greatest movies of all time. <laughs> Squints. This kind of looked like me at a, at a, at a, at a, when I was a little kid. Big glasses. This is squints. And this is a powerful moment in the, in the movie. Maybe the greatest one because he was in love with a, with a lifeguard named Wendy Peppercorn. And the guys were getting together and they said, oh man, she's so pretty over there. And they're like, how are we going to get her? How are we going to get our, our, her attention on us? So, all of a sudden, get squints, just runs out, gets out of the pool, and they're like, where's he going, where's he going? And he gets on the high dive, and one of them says, he can't swim, he's going the deep end, he's going to die. And so he's looking at Wendy. And she's not getting a time of day, and then he's sitting, standing there, and he's all shivering like this, and he waves at her in his picture, and then she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he jumps in and goes to the bottom. She takes off her glasses and her whistle and dives in there and gets them, pulls them out, and he's just kind of like this, you know, and, and pulls them out, and she, she starts performing CPR on him. You know the story. It's a great movie, all right? And so she's performing CPR on him, and then all of a sudden he just starts smiling because, one, she was kissing him, and two, is he finally got her attention, and he felt powerful. Those boys ran out of the swimming pool so excited and praised Squint. Go, man, you did it. You were noticed by Wendy Peppercorn. You were noticed. There's power in being noticed, and you're seeing it right here in the Bible. I can remember being 13 years old, Burt Reynolds drove into Evening Shade, Arkansas. Because there was a show, Evening Shade, a long time ago, if you remember. And he drove in, 
and he was the limo, and I'm kind of like squints here. He drives by me, my friend on our bike, and he drives by me, and I see this like shiny black car because all there is is beat up cars in Arkansas. <laughs> and he drives like, whoa, that didn't have a dent, and it's actually waxed. Like I could see myself on it. And so he drives through this, and he's in the backseat limo. He's right next to me. I go, what is going on? He drives by, and I go, and he looks at me and goes, and I thought, Burt Reynolds just waved at me because I, I felt empowered. And my friend next to me was like, no, man, he did to me. I was like, dude, he was looking at me. And so he drives by, you know, and at that point, I felt so excited and empowered. Like, he noticed me. We get excited whenever we go to a sports event and someone waves or, some, or, or somebody gets an autograph. Like, they noticed you. We get excited about that. But we don't get excited whenever we realize Jesus notices us in all the time. And we take that for granted. Jesus sees the apostles. He was praying so that at this point, these guys are struggling. Jesus, in the Bible, the book Mark says, he saw the disciples straining. He saw them. There's power there. We live in a world where it's often Oh, God, you know, I don't know, I'm, my struggle's so big that I know God's never going to notice or doesn't notice me. You know, there's so much stuff going on in the world, why would he notice me? He does notice you, and he cares. You're seeing it right here in Mark 6. How often do we wonder if God notices us in the struggle that we're in? How often? All the time I talk to people. All the time you talk to people, there are people struggling, and they're like, I just, he'll never, he doesn't notice me. He doesn't care. Yes, he does. He does care. The miracle of Jesus walking on water, as we see, is not just something biblical scholars and devout Christians know. You know the story, what's going to happen. See, it's a story that almost everyone knows. You know this. Here's the problem with this famous miracle in the Bible that we read and we're about to go into. We tend to focus on the act itself. If I told you this, that this story had nothing to do with Jesus walking on the water, you'd be like, what? But let me tell you something. I don't even think it is. I think that's cool and all, but there's something so deep we're missing. They, we tend to f focus on the act However, every time you, we read the Bible, I read the Bible, and see Jesus is doing something amazing, you have to ask yourself why he's doing it. Everything. He doesn't do anything just by random. He's always doing something with a point behind it. Jesus had a purpose. This is what happens. Let's give it back to our Bibles. He saw the disciples strain at the oars because the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake, and I'll stop right there. Fourth watch of the night, it's about three, three to five in the morning, he's going out to these guys. A time that's so, nothing's going on, he's, he's out there. He's with you in the time when you don't think he is. He goes out there. The waters are going all over the place. These guys are freaking out. They're, there's waters coming all over them. And what's interesting is this, what this water symbolized, why it's so scary, why to these guys they were so panicked. See, the waters in the Jewish mind, they symbolized chaos. They symbolized evil, death, and it was a place where Satan resided. This is where he lived. So when these waters are coming over him, this is Satan coming after them. And that's why they're so scared. The storm that they're going through, they're painfully trying to make headway, is a picture of a storm that was going on in their hearts and in their minds. That's what's happening here. They're panicked, the storm's coming over them, and they're falling apart. And let me tell you something, we go, as we all know, go through these storms all the time. And, and I can positively say that there are people here this morning that are in the middle of a storm. That is a storm that is so bad that you don't even know, you can't even think, you want to, you contemplate suicide. Yes, that happens. You contemplate, I need to let, I need to uh, get away from this marriage. 
It might be something where your children have gone the wrong way and you're blaming yourself for that. It might be something that you've lost a loved one and it is so hard. There is a storm that's happening in all of our lives. This is what you're seeing. You see, we can act like nothing's going on, but in reality, we are struggling. I am. I'm in the middle of a storm. I admit that. I confess that. There is a storm in my life that I am struggling with bad right now. And it's hard. It's, it's hard to get going. But I believe God can come, and he will, and he notices, and he's got to take care of me. There is, that happens. We've got to understand that if we do not detect that and we don't honestly own it, say, man, there's a problem, that's the deal, we'll never be healed. Back to your Bibles. Love this part. This was great. Oh, man, this is good. All right. He went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. Stop right there. You might have read that story before and never noticed that little verse. The question is, why was he going to pass it by? It's like, guys struggling in a boat here, and you see Jesus, like, walking in, and just be like, okay, well, I'm just going on. You see this happening. That does not seem like Jesus, does it? Because you, you want to believe Jesus is going to go, where are you at, and I'm going to find you. He doesn't do that. There are many speculations why he did this. It might be to the idea that, hey, if you're not going to call out to me, then you, and if you want to handle it yourself, I'm not going to be there. You go ahead and, with your pride and you see if you can do this, but you cannot do it without me. It might be that. It might be that, I don't know, he, just, he said, you guys deal with it. I don't know. But here's what I believe what happened. Mark was intentionally telling us, doing something here, when he states that Jesus walked by him, he was using, this, is, this gives me chill bumps. He was using the same language Moses wrote in Exodus 33. Moses said, please show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass by you. The same words. Mark uses. He is doing something here that is more profound. He's bringing the Old Testament, saying, man, I am that God. Moses here, at this point, was meeting with God. God told him he had found favor in his sight. And Moses had an astonishing request to say, please show me who you are. The apostles are doing the same thing. Their hearts were hardened after this food feeding the 5,000. And they show me who you are. And Jesus is about to pass them by. We read it in our world, in our American 20th, um, 21st or whatever, where we are now. <laughs> can't think of the word. As he just didn't care. But he's not. Mark's saying, Jesus is showing, I am the I am. I am not anybody to mess with. And I am over the storms. This happens again in 1 Kings chapter 19. The same thing comes up where Elijah is scared out of his mind. He doesn't know. He thinks he's the only one left in the world that loves Jesus. How many have been like that before? Does anybody else care? Like, what's good? Elijah does this. He says, so the Lord says, go out and stand on the mountain. And in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So the story goes, there's an earthquake and there's a firestorm and all this stuff happening. The same that's happening right here in Mark 6. The storm. And he said, I'm over this. I'm over this. Moses, back to the Moses, Moses asked God to show him his glory. And God answered him by saying two things. Read the Bible, look, I want to read, go back to the Bible and let's show you what he says here. He was about to pass by them, but when he saw them on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. I ask you to underline ghost. They cried out because all of them were, saw him were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. 
Do not be afraid. God, Moses asked God to show him his glory the same way God answered him by doing two things. First, just like this, he said he would make all his goodness pass before him, just like you're seeing right here in the New Testament. I'm gonna let my glory pass by you and show you who's in control. The exact same words that Mark, or Moses used, Mark uses. And the second thing is he said he would proclaim his name before him. His name is Lord, Yahweh, which literally means I am. That word right there in your Bible that you have in your hand that says in verse 50, take courage, it is I. It's not like, hey guys, it's me. Hey, just let you know it's me guys, hey. It's not. It's saying take courage, I am is here. I am the same thing that God told Moses. So he's putting these together. This is powerful stuff. Jesus walking on the water was not just showing off. That's not the point of this. It wasn't for him to show off. He was letting his entire divine glory passed by the disciples, just as God did for Moses and proclaimed his name. Now back to 48. Sorry, we're kind of jumping a little bit, but look in 48 in your Bible. Read it carefully here. He saw the disciples and strained the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking late. He was about to pass them by, 49, but when they saw him walking late, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out. I was, I mean, what, what? We were on a, um, about three years ago, me and Jessica were on a cruise, and um, we were at the end of the, it was, it was dark, it was real dark at night, after we all eaten and everything, all the entertainment, all that stuff, you know how it goes on a cruise, and you, you, we were at the back of the boat, and we were just looking over, and I was kind of leaning on the edge, and we are talking, and I said, how creepy would it be if you saw someone walking on that water? We're like, oh, man, that'd be, that'd be messed up, you know? And I said, I mean, and you see, because right at that time, there was a storm far away, so it kind of, the lightning kind of just made the waters look white, you know, at certain times. I thought, that'd be scary. I was like, yeah. And I said, imagine what Jesus, like, the apostles thought. So we were thinking, like, man, how this would be. See, Jesus is coming up to them. They're thinking he's a ghost, but they don't even recognize him. They don't recognize him. He's not so far away from these guys. He's not far away. They found themselves in danger. This storm that's going on. These guys are so scared of dying. Scared of all this stuff. Scared of what tomorrow may bring. What the next minute may bring. Their physical struggle that's happening now and painful attempt to make headway through the storm was a picture of the spiritual struggle in trying to understand who Jesus really is. We're the same way. You are too. We struggle with understanding who Christ is. We struggle with there's so much stuff going on in the world that's so bad. Why doesn't Jesus help? Or, oh man, if he loves us so much, why didn't he help this person? Oh, we struggle. That's okay. But it is not okay to say, well, I can fix it. I'm going to do it. It's all. You don't. You say, I don't know what's going on, but I know Jesus is Lord. He's resurrected from the grave, and he's coming back again. And he will take care of it. That's the key. These are con- that is a common danger we face as Christians today, that we face today. The disciples who were always around Jesus, his teaching, his kingdom work every day. However, they were still missing who he was. They were missing who he was. It's a ghost. I don't know this Jesus. Like, oh, who, is that right? You know, I don't know about all this. It's not a ghost. It's Jesus. He's saying go save, seek and save the lost. What's so ghost-like about that? You go and help people. Oh, he's saying, go love your enemies. Um, I don't know if I, is that a, I, I don't know if I can understand that. You love your enemies. This isn't hard. They miss 
They, they, were so, they were always around Jesus to teach his kingdom work. However, they were still missing who he was. And that's the da- danger we face. There's, there's a way always, there is a way to always be around Jesus without ever really knowing him. You can come to church the right, whole life and miss Jesus. You can come your whole life and miss Jesus. You can be a great church person, but you're not a great Christian. Sunday worship service, Bible studies, working in the haven, or anything missional we do are all great things, and we need to do those. But there's a way for us to be around these good things without ever really getting to know the best thing. The disciples are explaining it right here. The danger is we're, maybe we're serving, the danger is maybe we're serving Jesus and you know all about him, but you don't really know him. The disciples here are doing the same thing. They know him. I mean, my goodness. He's, he's already calmed the storm in chapter four. He's already healed these people. He's already just fed everybody in the sea of Athens with the, with the loaf. And, we're, and these guys are like, I don't know, man, that's science. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's Jesus Christ. It's God. It's his glory. We're missing him. We're missing him. And I believe this, as we close up this morning, is this. Three reasons why I believe, and I, I was thinking about this week, three reasons why we do not recognize him, why we miss him, is this. One is we're unaware. Many of us are just unaware that they're lost and they don't know the magnitude of a sin. It's like the prodigal son in Luke 15. He didn't know, he's like, yeah, whatever, I'll do whatever, no, no, no. Until he came to his sisters to realize like, man, Jesus is legit, he's real, and I gotta go back to my father. We haven't come to our senses yet. We are unaware that we're even doing anything wrong. I mean, I, I, This morning, you stole from God. Did you breathe? You stole air you cannot give back. And we go, whoa, God is so gracious and forgiving. He's like, I love you enough to give you that. We're unaware of that. Number two is we're uncommitted. Some will not come all the way to Jesus because the price requires your life. Luke Luke 9, verse 23 says, a person must be willing to deny himself and take up his cross daily. The hard times, the middle of the night nights, the times where like, oh, I got to, yeah, eh, it's, it's your life. You got to do it. And so we're not committed enough. We're like, yeah, at this part we are. The fun things, yeah, the tough where it's like, oh, we got to get people to do a work day. Nobody shows up. It's hard. You got to do it. It's part of like what we do. You got to commit to those things. Number three is spiritual blindness. I think that we, we're missing, who we're, we're not recognizing God in this way because spiritual blindness is they can be diligent in the scriptures but still not know who Christ is. It's the Pharisee way. You know all the things. Many maybe know Hebrew, Greek, and have PhDs and doctorates in theology and all this stuff, but you're missing Christ. You're missing the goodness he is. The spiritual blindness where Paul tells, tells us so many times, be very careful that wake up. Snap out of that. It's a, ch- a child can know who Christ is. You don't have to know everything to know Christ. Last thing here in the Bible talks about says they cry out to him, which is huge. The Bible says they cried out. And notice what Jesus does immediately in that verse. Verse 40 and 49 and 50. They cry out, and the next thing it says, immediately, Jesus responds. It wasn't like, I, I can't hear you. What was that, John, Peter? I can't hear you very good because the storm is loud. It wasn't like that. It, was like, it wasn't anyway. It's like immediately as soon as they said, help, he came. And he immediately runs to him. He climbs into the boat with them. Notice the Bible, they don't say, that the, the guys are sitting there like, what's he doing? Or how's it going? He, he just takes it on himself to be like, I'm getting in the boat with you. That's what it takes, people. That's what it takes, church. If you're gonna fall in love with Christ and make a relationship that is constant, that is loving, that is precious, that is real, 
You cry out to him and says, God, I can't do this. This is bad. This life, this storm that I'm in, I can't do it. Help. And Jesus says, you got it. And he gets in there with you. Many times he tries to get in and we're like, I got it, but can you give us that? But don't get in the boat with me. It's uncomfortable. That's one more person in the boat we can't fit. To cry out, express this humility, surrendering, a plea for mercy, helplessness, and desperation. That's what it takes. That's what the apostles learned. That's the power of these verses that we can read. That God is the God, that is, Jesus is the God that we serve and love, and he cares more than any person in this room about you. He loves you so much. He does. And we gotta remember that. Just like the story I started off with, with this storm, this tornado coming into Tulsa when I was a kid, and how the people responded in a strong alliance of Christians going, if it's your will, it's your will. If it's not, we're still going to serve you. I saw it that day, March 26, 1992. I asked you as a church to stand up to be like, man, I'm done. I'm done maybe playing the church games to just doing this. I want to know who Jesus is. I want to read these studies. I want to study with people. I want to learn the Gospels. I can remember on a mission trip in Nicaragua, I was talking to one of the preachers out there, and he said, David, you can, this was kind of, I kind of like took me back when he said this. Like, eh, that's, I don't know about that, man. That's kind of weird. He said, you can take away the Holy Testament, but do not ever, always, always, always read the Gospels. The power of Jesus, our Savior. That is the most powerful words ever written. And it's a story that's true. Powerful stuff. This morning, if you're here and you're in that, you're in that boat or you're, you're, you're freaking out of going, what do I do tomorrow? How am I gonna make it another day? How am I gonna make another paycheck? How am I gonna do this? The answer is here in Mark 6. It says, Jesus saying, it is I. I am over all that. Take courage. Don't be afraid. But will the question be for you this morning, will you let him in your boat? This morning, if you have anything, this is a good church. If you're visiting, this is a good church that loves people that loves the Lord. It's addicting. We want to help. We want to help. But we also, church, want to help you too. Know who Christ is. Know how to be joyful in the hard times. If there's anything this morning that we can do, or you can help us, come now as we stand and sing.